Welcome to Landmark Chambers book launch uh, webinar, Planning and Rights of Way in National Parks, the Broads and AOMBs. Uh, we're delighted uh, to see so many of you joining the session today. We hope you'll find the presentations and the discussion to be uh, useful uh, and informative. Uh, my name is James Marici, QC. Uh, I will chair the session um, today uh, and I'm joined by my colleagues, John Litton, QC, James uh, Neal, Jacqueline Lean, Matthew Dale Harris and Nick Grant, who I'll formally uh, introduce in a moment. To begin with the usual housekeeping points to note, uh, first of all, uh, your microphones are automatically uh, muted. Uh, so you will need, uh, to, you, there's no need for you to do anything to adjust your local settings. Um, we very much welcome questions throughout the session. Uh, please submit them via text in the Q&A section which may be found either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on how you've got it set up. And we'll endeavour, having had all the presentations, to answer as many questions as possible at the end of those presentations. Uh, the webinar is recorded and you will receive a link to the presentation and the recording uh, shortly after the event uh, concludes. If your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, we would simply invite you to rejoin the meeting using the same link that you used originally to join um uh, the meeting uh, so this is uh, a book launch um the um book which uh, i have co-written with a number of my colleagues uh, several of whom are uh, making presentations today uh, focuses on planning and rights away in national parks um, the broads and aomb's um, for those of you who uh, are attending the uh, webinar uh, there's a link to um, the publisher's website where you can buy the book um, and there is also a discount code um, which entitles you to a 20% um, reduction in the cost of the book. Uh, that Those details have already been provided to you in your confirmation emails in relation to the webinar um, but uh, in addition I think we're going to share in a moment the details uh, in the chat um, box uh, so that you can see um, those. Um, we hope you agree it's an important topic um, that we have uh, covered uh, many of us have worked uh, over the years uh, on a number of uh, occasions on uh, cases involving um, uh, national parks, AOMBs and the broads, either in relation to development within or development out with those um, designations. Um, but there hasn't until now uh, been a book that's looked to focus on planning and, and rights of way issues in those uh, uh, important landscape designation areas uh, of this um, country. Um, when we wrote this book, uh, it was during uh, lockdown, and um, I suppose it's only uh, fitting that um, we are launching the book with another lockdown coming. I think when we wrote it, we very much hoped this could be an in-person event, but sadly not. Uh, maybe for the second edition or, well, 10th edition, who knows, uh, we might actually be able to have a, a real uh, event um, and see people uh, in person. So let me introduce the um, uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, uh, Nick Grant. Nick joined uh, Chambers in 2019 following the completion of a third six. He practices in planning, property, environmental and compulsory purchase law. He particularly enjoys cases and issues that cross Chambers uh, areas uh, as matters in national parks and AMBs often do. He's previously appeared for a rule six party at an inquiry concerning the impact of an incinerator on the setting of an AOMB. Um, and he's currently uh, acting uh, with myself on a Transport Works Act order um, for the construction of an offshore tidal array that makes landfall on an AOMB um, which raises AOMB uh, issues. Um, then Matthew Del Harris. Um, Matthew um, uh, has a wide-ranging uh, planning and environmental law practice. Um, in addition to his contributions uh, to this book, he also writes for Garner's Environmental Law and the Planning Encyclopedia and he's the editor of the environment section of the civil court uh, practice. He regularly advises and acts for national park authorities and other planning authorities in relation to development within national parks and AOMBs, as well as for developers and objectors. John Litton uh, QC. John has uh, 30 years experience as a barrister. He's been a QC since 2010. Uh, he practices in planning and environmental law, both in the UK but also internationally, particularly in Hong Kong. He has extensive experience of development in national parks and AOMBs uh, and affecting national parks and AOMBs. 
uh, including uh, in the Green and South Downs National Park um, case. Um, and he represented a group of joint local authorities, including the South Downs National Park, uh, in the Wealdon uh, local plan uh, examination. Um, James Neal. Um, James is a planning barrister of over 14 years experience, uh, particular expertise in the regulatory framework affecting development in national parks, uh, SSSIs and AOMBs. He, uh, along with myself, represented the South Downs National Park Authority in its promotion of its local plan in 2019. And James regularly advises national park authorities in relation to development management and uh, planning uh, policy uh, issues. Uh, and then Jacqueline Lean. Jacqueline has the classic landmark uh, crossover uh, practice uh, encompassing planning, um, public property and environmental law. Um, her practice encompasses all matters concerning the use and development of land. She has significant experience of planning and infrastructure projects. Uh, she's been involved in HS2 um, right from the, uh, the beginning. Um, but also she's been involved in infrastructure projects that affect or are within national parks and AOMBs and projects which interface with uh, public uh, rights of way. So those are our uh, speakers. I'm now going to hand over to the first of our um, speakers, Nick Grant, who's going to cover uh, recent case law. Um, Nick. Brilliant, thank you very much. James, in true, sorry, just connecting to the screen. Excellent. Um, in typical fashion, having spent, as James said, this summer preparing for this book and researching the various case law duties uh, or case law and duties of national parks, which was relatively settled, um, about two days before we went to print, uh, I got an email from James saying, there's a new case out, we should probably include it. Uh, that's the case that I'm going to talk about primarily today. But first, I'm going to set the context. So as we explore in the book, national parks are established by part of the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act 1949, as amended. Uh, section 5 outlines the purposes of national parks legislation, and that is up on your slide. There are two, conserving and enhancing the natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage of national parks, and then promoting opportunities for the understanding and enjoyment of the special qualities of those areas. Um, Clearly, there could be a conflict between these two. The best way, arguably, to fully conserve and enhance the beauty of a national park is to keep everybody away from it and never let them go near it. Uh, on the other hand, you can see how building a bustling visitor centre and nice concrete paths might best promote opportunities to understand the qualities of national parks, uh, but might start to undermine their beauty and heritage. So, how is this to be reconciled? Um, well, that was brought, that was caught up in the, brought up, sorry, uh, caught by the Sanford Committee, or to give it its proper name, the National Park Policies Review Committee um, in 1974. They noted that the second principle, public enjoyment, uh, needed to be qualified. Excessive or unsuitable use may destroy the qualities that attract people to national parks. Uh, it concluded, again, recall this is in the 1970s, that if faced with a conflict, the preservation uh, objective had to prevail. Now that sets the contact for section 11A, um, and the section 11A was uh, put into the 1949 Act um, by the Environment Act 1995. So Parliament had a good you know, uh, 20 years or so to get used to the idea. Now section 11A1 is currently on your screen. Um, this is a broad uh, point for national uh, national park authorities, um, and it says that in pursuing the purposes specified in section one for section five one, which is what you've just been looking at, um, seek to foster the economic cooperation and social well-being of local communities. All very nice. Uh, this was considered in Harris decision, of Mr. Justice Holgate in uh, 2016, where he said this imposes relatively broad duties. Um, largely dependent on the value judgments made by a national park from time to time. Uh, the importance of that I will come back to. Um, Sanford Committee, as I've seen referenced on your slide, um, and then we get section 11A2, and this is the main bit that I want to talk about today. Uh, so you've got that on your slide, and I suggest um, reading it, but effectively it says in exercising or performing any functions in relation to or so as to affect land in a national park, 
any relevant authority shall have regard to the purposes specified in subsection one those are the, of section five those are the two uh, objectives about to which i've just referred um, and if it appears that there is a conflict between those two shall attach greater weight to the purpose of conserving and enhancing the natural beauty wildlife and cultural heritage of the area so the conservation point prevails um, I'm going to come back to that. That last bit, the underlined bit on your slide, is the embodiment of what has now become known as Sanford Principle. Um, I'm going to come back to that shortly, but some key points about Section 11A2. Um, first, the duty applies when undertaking any function uh, in relation to or so as to affect land in a national park. Now, that is very, very broad, uh, and we think deliberately so. Um, second, the duty applies to any relevant authority. Those are defined in section subsection 11A3 and 4, but basically it includes any minister of the crown, any public body, any statutory undertaker. Uh, you would in fact be hard pressed to find one that wasn't included um, within this definition. Uh, third, the function probably includes both powers and duties. Hazel, um, which, and Hammersmith and Fulham LBC, which is cited on your screen. Now that's not a National Parks case, but concerns the Local Government Act 1972. Um, there is a famous dicta by Lord Templeman that says that functions embraces all the duties and powers of the local authorities, and we think the same probably applies here. Um, the duty is to have regard to the purposes. Uh, it's a process, uh, process duty. It's not an outcome orientated duty. Um, fourth, the purposes in section 11A2, uh, so those two uh, particular points that I've raised, they're not the only thing a decision maker will need to consider. They're two very important considerations, but that's if a decision maker has had regard to those two points, that's not the end of the matter. We get that from Harris. Um, again, Mr. Justice Holgate very clear on that. Um, and finally, with the exception of the Sanford principle and subject, of course, to the uh, overarching public law principle of irrationality, the weight to be given to various purposes, including this, um, various national park purposes, is manifestly a matter for the decision maker. Uh, and again, that's Tesco stores again, it's not a national park case, but it, uh, it makes the point in general planning law with which I'm sure many of you on this call will be familiar. So we then get to the Sanford principle and this second half uh, of section 11A2. Um, and how is that particular weight to be implemented? Well, again, up until we decided to write this book, uh, it had been given relatively little consideration. In fact, the only case considering it was in Harris itself. Um, the factual background to that's not wholly relevant, but basically the Broads Authority, which is set up under a different statute, the Norfolk and Suffolk Broads Act, wanted to rebrand itself or rebrand the Broads as the Broads National Park. Um, the Broads Act, under which, of course, the authority works and operates does not include the Sanford principle, only the National Parks Act does. And so an argument was put about whether it would be misleading to allow the Broads Authority to do that. Um, in the course of submissions, there was some discussion about the Sanford principle and how it works. The claimants argued that it required the conservation objective to prevail. In any given case, the defendant instead, it simply required greater weight to be given to the conservation objective, but it didn't require the conservation objective to prevail. Um, Mr. Justice Holgate didn't really need to resolve this issue, and so he didn't, um, but he held for those interested that the general ground um, that renaming it would be misleading was just unsustainable. So that's the background. That's how things were up until earlier this year. We then get to Stubbs and Green Lane's environmental action movement. Um, and factual background is this. Um, it concerned two lanes in the National Park. Those could be used by both pedestrians and motor traffic, but they had deteriorated. Um, they had both surfaced and unsurfaced sections. Now, they were deteriorating to such, the ex such an extent that the agricultural traffic found it difficult to access the land for farming purposes. The National Park Authority was asked uh, by an amenity group to make a traffic regulation order prohibiting vehicles uh, from using the unsurfaced sections of the lanes. National Park Authority refused. It produced a report um, noting its obligation under the Sanford principle, i.e. that conservation had to prevail. Um, but that report said that where there was an irreconcilable conflict between protecting the environment and promoting public enjoyment, the former was more important. 
Um, it concluded that it didn't have to make a TRO because there was not at this point in time an irreconcilable conflict and the matter could be managed. The claimant sought to JR that. Uh, three grounds of, uh, were put forward. Um, I'm only going to focus on one. They argued that the Sanford principle kicks in whenever there is a conflict between the purposes, not an irreconcilable conflict. Mr Justice Dove, uh, very helpfully for the first real case on the Sanford Principle, reviewed Harris. He, reduced, he reviewed the background to the Sanford Principle. He looked at the statutory debates, previous government guidance, the reports, um, and pretty much anything else you, that, that could have been put before him. So we have before us, so, or he had before him, a pretty comprehensive review. Um, and he said that both purposes in Section 5 are set out on an equal footing. Both contain objectives that are to be pursued. Section 11A2 is included only to remedy situations where it is not possible to treat the two purposes equally. Conflict, therefore, does not mean any conflict. Um, the two purposes will often be a conflict. Something more than that has got to be required. Um, in circumstances where it is judged that both cannot be accommodated by the National Park Authority and the National Park Authority concludes it must make a choice, then Section 11A2 requires the first purpose to be awarded greater weight and prevail. But crucially, whether there is an irreconcilable conflict um, is a question of judgment for the NPA. Section 11A2 is simply a way of breaking the deadlock. So that is the most recent to most important case on the Sanford principle. Um, that's pretty much where I'm going to leave it. The overarching point is that it's really a matter for the National Park Authority to conclude if it can't manage both those objectives, um, and that is a value judgment for it. So if you're hoping to JR it on the basis that it's got it wrong, got that wrong. Um, you've got a pretty, pretty steep hill ahead of you. But I'm going to leave that there and I'm going to hand over to Matthew Dale Harris. Thank you very much, Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, now, my first slide. So, I'm going to be talking about um, the role of national park authorities, the Broads Authority and um, AOMBs in the planning system. That's, that's a pretty, um, pretty wide ranging topic and I think I've only got 10 minutes. So rather than go through the detail of all of that, what I'm really going to talk you through is um, the structure and um, the format of the two particular chapters that we've, um, we've got in the book, um, which have been authored um, by myself and James Neal and Kate Olley. So we've got we've we've split it into two chapters. The first one deals with national park authorities and the Broads Authority, and the second with AOMBs. And I think our view in creating the book was that this was an area where there really was value add um, in creating a book that focuses specifically on um, these forms of designation, because whereas different aspects of um, of the functions and roles of the various authorities and of AMBs are, are found in other in other textbooks. It was really an opportunity to bring everything together um, so it could be seen side by side and then break it down by by role and function within particular subheadings. So that's that's what we've tried to do in the book. Um, chapter two, which deals with the National Park Authority and Brawls authorities, um, have kind of three main strands in it. Um, we look at the establishing legislation, um, both in England and Wales, um, no national parks currently in, in Northern Ireland. Um, we pull out key features of their, of their status and constitution um, and discuss in particular um, the mem different, differing membership requirements um, that exist in respect of different um, national parks. Um, most notable difference being the difference between the English authorities, the English National Park authorities, um, and the Welsh ones, because the, the English ones have um, parish members, um, and then the particular circumstances and situation for the Broads Authority, which is Nick um, Nick's referred to in the context of the Harris case, is um, is similar in many ways to the National Park authorities, but is distinct and, and critically arises under an, a different statute without. Um, without the Sanford principle in place. We then look at the, the impact of national park authorities and, and the Broad Authority on de development control functions and plan making. And I'll take you through some of the headings in a little bit more detail. So key issue 
for a lot of um, a lot of people working in the sector are likely to be um, establishing which functions accrue to the national park authorities or the broads authority. Um, we outline the key provisions, particularly section 4A of the Town and Country Planning Act, which, um, which essentially um, makes the national park authorities sole planning authorities for most purposes, um, with the exception of certain powers in relation to tree protection, um, and the maintenance of, of land, which are exercised concurrently um, with the, the local authorities or the district authorities um, as applicable. Um, slightly different position for the broads, which we go into in the book. Um, and then we look at the specific consultation requirements, um, i.e. the particular duty on neighbouring planning authorities to consult national park authorities or the broads authority in relation to any scheme which falls outside of the national park, um, but which um, is likely to affect um, the national park. So quite an important consultation duty under the Development Management Procedure Order. Um, we discuss administrative arrangements to some extent. I mean, it's not a, it's not, that's not the focus of the chapter, but we look at particularly um, the situation around the South Downs National Park Authority, which being I mean, as the most recent authority in some ways quite an unusual one because it it spans I think 11 maybe maybe more authorities um, across an area from Winchester to Brighton it has specific administrative arrangements where it um, it shares it, it, it contracts out effectively some of its functions to other local planning authorities other district councils um, and then we also look at the various parts of the planning regime which are essentially modified by um, the fact that land falls within a national park. So in relation to the EIA regime, um, there's a difference in the way that one approaches Schedule 2 development, don't apply thresholds in the same way. And there are also quite significant changes to the general um, permitted development order. Um, we go through in what I hope is not too much excruciating detail, some of the um, particular consultation requirements that rise under the 2008 Acts, um, this is in relation to um, nationally significant infrastructure projects, um, which in, in practice often often are a, a major area for um, of concern for um, for the relevant authorities. Under plan making, um, we provide a, a, a general overview of the 2004 Act duties, and particularly um, the tests that apply around soundness. Um, and then we look in some detail at the various ways in which the statutory duties, um, statutory purposes um, under the 1949 Act that Nick's already referred to, the way in which those interact with, um, with the duty to, um, with, with the requirement for soundness. Um, and we also talk about the management plans which are required to be put in place under, under the 95 Act. On AONBs, um, there's a slightly wider scope um, because Northern Ireland also comes into play. So we go through the, the criteria, the procedure and the mechanisms for amendment that exist um, for the various um, nature conservation bodies. So NRW in Wales, Natural England in, in England and the Northern Irish in Environment Agency. So the ways in which those particular powers um, operate. Um, but the focus is really more on um, the way in which AOMBs function in practice, um, the duty to give great weight, um, the duties to um, prepare management plans and their content and purpose. Um, and we also look at, um, at the conservation boards, which have been established, I think, to date only in relation to two AOMBs. One of them you've got up there on the slide, um, the Chilterns, and the other not so far away is the Cotswolds, which were two AOMBs where broadly the, the, the policy decision and, and the test under the Act is that um, it was thought that due to the complexities around um, the management of these areas, because they, again, because they go across so many different local planning authority areas, local planning authorities being the, the institution which normally has responsibility for um, prepare, preparing management plans and for in protecting the AOMB because of the range of different um, local authorities which were which were affected and um, it was thought 
in those two circumstances um, appropriate to um, create conservation boards, which um, have a number of functions which reflects those found in the um, in the National Park Authority regime, but obviously don't um, don't take over the same range of functions um, that national park authorities do. So we draw out the distinctions there between um, a national park authority and the conservation board. Um, we also, um, in chapter three, go into the duty to have regard to the purpose of conserving and enhancing the natural beauty of AOMBs. Um, in practice, often this is, well, certainly for the most development control decisions, this is obviously a critical subject. Um, and we go into the MPPF test, and, which is effectively the same as the test in um, Planning Policy Wales, um, great weight and um, looking at the test for major development. Um, and we also discuss the, the Northern Irish um, um, policy test in the strategic planning policy statement. Um, a lot of that material is then given much more detail in our chapter four, which specifically focuses on um, on the English policy test, which I think um, are accepted to um, have some potential for read across to the uh, policy context of the other um, of the other non-Scottish UK nations. Um, so that's 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 the overview of what we what we do within uh, within the chapter. Um, and um, I think at that point I will pass on to um, John Lytton, who will be looking at some of the most recent um, national policy and guidance issues. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you, Matthew. Um, I have to make a confession immediately, which is that I'm not a contributor to this book, um, but I have read it, and I would fully endorse it as a very concise source of information, law, and policy on national landscapes. Um, uh, with that said, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes or so, um, a bit like a magpie, uh, picking up on some of the national policies that relate to uh, national landscapes and obviously in particular uh, national parks and AONBs. Um, and the starting point for that is the NPPPF uh, and in particular paragraph 11, which as everyone will be familiar with, um, does two particular things, one in relation to plan making and the other in relation to decision, decision making. And so far as plan making is concerned, um, the, it disapplies the requirement for strategic policies uh, to provide for objectively assessed need, uh, where, other, where the application of other NPPF policies protecting areas of particular importance, which are then uh, defined by footnote six, uh, provides strong reasons for restricting the scale type and distribution of development. And in relation to the development control decisions, planning applications and the like, um, it uh, again disapplies the tilted balance where the protection of such areas provides a clear reason for refusal. Um, and then the other uh, source of national policy in relation to AONBs and national parks is uh, in paragraph 172. I, I suspect that most people will be familiar with that. It clearly attaches great weight to the conservation and enhancement of landscapes and scenic beauty of both national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty. But it also looks to enhance wildlife and cultural heritage. Uh, these are matters which have to be given great weight in national parks, and it's also an important consideration in AONBs. And that reflects in due course when we touch on the uh, Glover Review. Um, <coughs> It, uh, paragraph 172 also limits the scale and extent of development uh, that you might expect in, in areas that are protected such as this, and it presumes that major development uh, should be refused other than in exceptional circumstances uh, and where the development is in the public interest. Uh, major development is not defined uh, in the same way as the uh, development management procedure order, um, and it looks at the, the significance of the impacts on, on the area in order to determine whether or not it, it is major development. Um, where it is major development, then it needs to uh, assess need. It has to look at alternatives. 
has to look at the impacts of permitting or indeed refusing development on the local economy, in addition to the impacts on the environment. <laughs> Um, <laughs> there is a National Park Circular which relates to uh, the national parks in, in England. Um, it's now getting a little long in the tooth. Ten years ago it was published. Uh, it's not referred to in the NPPF, but it is referred to in the um, National Planning Policy Guidance. It only applies to national parks. It sets out a vision uh, to 2030. Um, so on that basis, it's, it remains extant, uh, but it did make a commitment to being reviewed within five years of publication, which in fact has never happened. Um, so although it remains extant, um, it is getting a little long in the tooth now. Um, then in terms of sort of prospective policy, um, <clears throat> the Glover Review uh, was published in September 2019, possibly being a little overlooked um, in, in this year, in the course of this year, um, because of the pandemic events. Um, there hasn't yet been any government response to that Glover review. Um, it's anticipated, but again, I suspect it's held up by, by more recent events and more pressing events. Now, it contains 27 proposals for reform of national parks, the broads and AOMBs with an, a particular emphasis on the restoration of nature, broadening access and, new des and designating new uh, national landscapes, including uh, the redesignation of some existing AONBs to uh, become national parks in their own right. <clears throat> um, I, there's just one particular proposal that I wanted to touch on uh, for the purposes of today, and that's proposal six, uh, and, and the fact that it looks to strengthen the place for national landscapes in the planning system, uh, with AONBs uh, being given statutory constituency status uh, and encouragement to develop local plans and changes to the national planning policy framework. In, in relation to AONBs, <clears throat> of course, they don't have any planning functions in the same way that national park authorities do. Um, indeed, rather surprisingly, that they don't they don't actually have uh, any status as a statutory consultee, such as um, Historic England or, 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 or um, uh, Natural England. Um, and so there is a proposal that they should be given that consultee status, statutory consultee status, so that they are uh, <coughs> they are consulted in relation to applications uh, automatically. Um, and that would also be an encouragement to propose to, uh, to developers who are proposing development in or close to AOMBs, perhaps to discuss those applications with AOMB boards uh, before they make their applications. Um, <clears throat> there is uh, uh, certainly an encouragement to develop local plans because obviously AOMB boards are not local authorities, they don't produce generally their own uh, plans, um, and yet they are frequently areas which straddle a number of different local planning authority areas. And so uh, there is a desire that they should, uh, in consultation with, and, and in conjunction with those other local planning authorities, produce single development plan documents, which draw together a, a suite of comprehensive um, development and management development policies, so that the uh, development in those areas can be better planned. And then, <clears throat> Well, they also talk about uh, strengthening really uh, the existing national policies in the NPPF to give effect to the um, requirement to give um, significant weight to the protection of, of designated uh, landscapes. Um, <clears throat> insofar as the future is concerned, um, <clears throat> there's obviously been the white paper planning for the future uh, and also there is the prospective environment bill. In terms of the white paper, it's actually quite light in, uh, in, in, in terms of its discussion of national parks and AONBs, but I think it's fair to say <clears throat> that uh, if we end up with a zonal system, then AONBs and national parks uh, will end up as being protected areas. Um, there is no mention of protection zones around national parks uh, and AONBs. Um, even though clearly development on the outside of those areas may well have an effect on the areas themselves. Um, and we'll have to wait and see whether um, those buffer zones or protective areas around national parks, the ANBs, 
are also uh, included within the uh, protection of protective uh, areas. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of the Environment Bill, um, it is proposed to include a requirement for the pre preparation of local nature recovery strategies, which would be prepared uh, by local planning authorities, but also uh, certain responsible bodies, including national parks. Um, and, and that very much chimes in with some of the rhetoric in the Glover Review and the importance of restoring nature in particularly national parks and, and AOMBs as being really a touchstone to regenerating their, their areas. Um, and so that requirement, if and when the Environment Bill is passed into law, is intended to be an important aspect of um, protecting national parks going forward. Um, and so with those remarks, I am going to hand on to James Neal. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about biodiversity and conservation in the national parks. Um, in particular, I'm going to focus on um, forthcoming changes to legislation in the Environment Bill, which John's just uh, mentioned, which really strengthen um, national parks authorities' powers to secure biodiversity improvement. Um, in the, if we just jump onto the next slide, delay. Thank you. In the, um, in, in the current context, I thought what I'd do in this slide is just set out the current purposes and powers of uh, national parks authorities. And uh, Nick's already mentioned the, the key statutory purpose of uh, national parks set out in section five of the uh, National Parks and Countryside Act 1949, um, and the, the which includes the key purpose of conserving and enhancing the natural beauty and wildlife of national park um, in, in their areas. So below that primary statutory purpose, there are some specific, there currently are some specific powers in legislation in relation to, to, to nature conservation and biodiversity. Perhaps most importantly um, is the power under section 21 of the 1949 Act uh, conferred on national parks and indeed other local planning authorities to establish nature reserves and they've got um, a, a, their co compulsory purchase powers uh, associated with that. There's also an express power under section 39 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act um, to enter into management agreements uh, with landowners and then of course there's the, the, the duty to conserve under section 40 of the, the NERC Act. Now that, that those are the current uh, the current statutory purposes and, and, and duties that are most relevant. There's also in relation to um, AOMBs the uh, powers conferred on conservation boards, um, which um, uh, Matt's already mentioned under Section 84 of the Countryside Rights of Way Act. And I'm not going to go into any particular detail on that for purposes of today. But what, what I thought the, the key the key way in which uh, national park authorities can secure uh, biodiversity and conservation improvements is clearly through their function, uh, their planning functions. Now currently, um, even in national policy, currently national policy, there's already um, plenty of um, support for biodiversity gain um, in uh, the current MPPF. Um, so I've set out some of the, the relevant extracts on the slide. For example, uh, paragraph 170, uh, D, which states that planning policies should contribute um, to an enhance uh, natural and local environment by minimizing impacts and providing net gains for biodiversity, including by establishing coherent ecological networks. Um, paragraph 174B, in respect to plan making, says that plans should identify and pursue opportunities for measurable net gains for biodiversity. Um, paragraph, it should say 175D. Um, says that uh, 
in the term, in the development plan in development management context so planning in making planning decisions opportunities to incorporate biodiversity improvements in and around development should be encouraged especially where this can secure measurable net gains for biodiversity the in terms of the the actual uh, any um, the, in terms of the whether or not um, refusal should take place at the moment the national policy only says where development resulting in the loss of or deterioration of irreplaceable habitat should be refused uh, unless there are wholly exceptional reasons and, and suitable compensation uh, strategy exists. Um, but but there's so there's the whole uh, current national policy context is support for biodiversity improvement, but no mandatory requirements. Now, of course, those those national current national policy objectives are already being reflected in current local plans, for example, the South Downs Nation uh, Local Plan, South Down National Park Local Plan has um, its policy SD2 says expressly that development proposals will be permitted where um, in effect they provide more and better, more better and joined up natural habitats and various other um, local planning authorities are introducing net gain um, type of uh, net gain policies. Um, however, um, as a result of um, the um, environment bill, there's going to be um, the whole shift towards biodiversity net gain is now going to become far more mandatory and, and will have a lot, the, the regime will have a lot more teeth. Um, the, the environment bill does three main things. In, in effect, it, it amends the duty to conserve on in section 40 of the NERC Act and adds in and enhance. Now, for national parks, that of course doesn't really change much because it's already got its, its prime purpose or one of its statutory purposes is to conserve and enhance uh, natural beauty and wildlife. But um, that would bring up to the same level, the same standard, in fact, uh, the, what other local authorities have to do in respect to nature conservation. Secondly, the Environment Bill um, makes the, the key provisions and the key changes are clauses 92 to 94, which make provision for biodiversity gain. Now, the way that the way that the reform is going to happen is that a new section uh, 90A is inserted into the, the Town and Country Planning Act, which then imports the substantive provisions set out in a new Schedule 7A into the, uh, the, the, the Town and Country Planning Act. And the, key, and the key change is that all permissions uh, following the coming into force of the Environment uh, Bill or Act will be subject to a deemed condition requiring the submission and approval of a biodiversity gain plan to secure the biodiversity gain objective. Um, there's also, and the third aspect of the Environment Bill is a, a new part, um, part seven um, introduces the power to enter into uh, conservation covenants, and I'll touch on those briefly at the end. Now, what is biodiversity net gain for the purposes of the environment, or how is it going to be? Um, how is it going to be calculated? Biodiversity, um, the biodiversity gain objective. So, the, the the objective that a biodiversity gain plan has to meet in order to be approved is described in the following way: It's met in relation in relation to development for which planning permission is granted, if the biodiversity value attributable to the development exceeds the pre-development biodiversity value of on-site habitat by at least the relevant percentage. We'll come on in a moment to look at what that is. What is biodiversity value? Well, the Act or the Bill says that it's comprised of really three things, the post-development biodiversity value of on-site habitat, so that's the, the improvement on site to valued habitat. The biodiversity value in relation to the development of any registered off site biodiversity gain allocated to development. And then finally, um, the biodiversity of any biodiversity credits purchased for the development. So it's incorporating some aspects of an offsetting system by this use of um, credit purchase. Um, although the offsetting is not merely to compensate. It's now going to be to improve um, biodiversity value overall. Um, the, 
just a little bit more on bio calculate for biodiversity value. Um, the relevant percentage is 10%, so the improvement to biodiversity to be secured by development has to be 10%. That's going to be calculated by reference to um, the biodiversity metric published by the Secretary of State. Um, we don't have any detail on what that's going to include. The, the way pre-development biodiversity value is calculated, so the sort of baseline value of the, of the site, um, will mean that um, activities for which planning permission is not required can't be used to reduce that value. Post-development um, is the projected value at the time development is completed. And then an important point, value can only be taken into account when, when working out this, the, the net biodiversity value gain. If the local planning authority is satisfied, it will be secured by either a condition or a planning obligation or a conservation covenant for at least 30 years. So there's two aspects to the way this is the, the regime will have teeth. It will be both through a pre-commencement condition and then an, an, some further obligations actually securing, su su substantively securing the, the gains proposed in the biodiversity gain plans. And then again, off-site gains can, can only be taken into account is secured by planning obligation or conservation covenant and recorded in what's uh, referred to as a biodiversity game register, which effectively again establishes the baseline so that when looking at further developments, the, there's an you have, it will ensure an incremental gain because other developments that have um, secured planning, uh, have secured biodiversity value, that they, they will be registered and that will then raise the baseline for any future development. And they'll have to move and provide benefits above that baseline uh, in order to meet the requirements um, in the schedule. Now, the just finally, the third, third key aspect of the bill, um, which I'd like to talk about, is the, the use of conservation covenants, because these are a, a new um, statutory agreement that can be entered into by responsible bodies. Um, it, they, they are the culmination of a, a long-term project by the Royal Commission, to, which will enable positive obligations or the burden of positive obligations to run with the land and bind successes and titles. So very similar to the um, to Section 106 in, in that respect. Um, a conservation covenant agreement is an agreement which contains provisions of a qualifying kind. And effectively, that, that all that means is that it imposes obligations on a landowner not to do or to, or to positively do something uh, in relation to, to that landowner's land or allows a public body um, to do something or requires that public body to also do it. For a, 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 an agreement has to have a conservation purpose and come on to what that means in a moment and it has to be intended by the parties to be for the public good. Um, and as I've said before, the key clause is clause 1072, which allows uh, landowner obligations to bind successes and title. Now, um, any public body, so long as it's deemed suitable by a secretary of state that has a conservation function, uh, can be designated as a responsible body. And so it seems to me um, extremely likely that, that, that all national park authorities will be designated in this way. Finally, the only way a, a conservation covenant can be amended is by the upper tribunal if it considers it reasonable to do so in all the circumstances. So there won't be the same um, source of mechanism that exists for 106 agreements, which requires an application to be made by the, to the authority and then possibly an appeal, appeal made against that decision. It's going to, it seems to me these conservation covenants are going to be um, much harder to modify and uh, and have um, a little bit uh, com certainly compared to section 106s and um, and that may be the reason the, the ease with which 106s can be revisited may be one of the reasons why um, the um, the environment bill has taken a different um, route in terms of modifications trying to avoid the the um, all the arguments that have and, and complications that have received through applications to modify section 106s um, so what is, just finally, what is a conservation purpose for the purposes of a cons conservation agreement? Um, the, the Act says that a conservation um, 
purpose uh, has three aspects to it. It's firstly to conserve the natural environment of the land or the natural resources of the land. Um, to conserve land as a place of archaeological, architectural, artistic, cultural or historic interest. And then finally, um, to conserve the setting of land with a natural environment or natural resources, or which is a place of archaeological, architectural, artistic, cultural, historic interest. Now, um, it's, it's evident from looking at that, that such definition that it's the conservation purpose is very broad in scope for the purpose of these agreements. And it's not, they're not really, it's not really limited to biodiversity conservation. Um, the reference to setting in particular in subsection C um, on that, on this particular slide, enlarges its scope in a in fairly, um, fairly significant way, a fairly broad way, um, because um, it would stands to reason that most land has a natural, most land would have some sort of natural environment. So as long as you're conserving the setting of that, you can enter into an agreement in respect of it. So, um, so there we are, Th those are the, um, those are the key aspects or key direction of travel in respect of nature conservation and uh, biodiversity improvement. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to, uh, to Jacqueline, who's going to talk about access to national parks uh, and the broads and rights of way. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Um, so the, the second part of the book um, covers access rights, public rights of way, things of that sort. Um, obviously, I'm going to try and give a quick overview of what the book covers today, but it's a quite complicated subject and I don't think I can quite squeeze it all into to 12 minutes. So just in terms of an overview, uh, chapter seven and eight really cover three matters. Firstly, is public rights of way. Secondly, the right to roam, um, which was conferred by the 2000 Act. And it also touches on um, rights of common and status of land as common land. In terms of uh, public rights of way, I'm sure it's very well known to people uh, listening today. There's four essential characteristics that you need to have. The way open to the public at large. The public must have the right to use the way. The public right must be primarily for passage and it must follow a defined route. And in general terms, you'd expect to find public rights of way, which aren't roads, on the definitive map and statement for the, the relevant county or the metropolitan district or the, the London borough. In terms of the, the types of route or way that we're looking at, essentially it's now four categories. Firstly, footpaths, clues in the name, really it's a, a right of way on foot only. There are some accompaniments which you can have with that, though there's no definitive or statutory list of that. From the case law, um, and generally we seem to be at dogs are okay, bicycles are not. Um, perambulators are also included according to one old case. Um, bridleways, uh, which can be used by pedestrians, horse riders and cyclists, although cyclists must give way to those other users. Um, mechanically propelled vehicles are not permitted, so quad bikes, no but the, uh, the Highways Act, and by reference to the Road Traffic Act 1988, it excludes electrically assisted pedal cycles from the definition of mechanically propelled vehicles. One thing to note, just in respect to the relationship between footpaths and bridleways, is that if you do have a situation where a footpath is being um, regularly used or used by a number of equestrians, it may be that that gives rise to um, essentially deemed bridleway rights uh, if it goes on for a while. So it could involve a redesignation of the footpath as a bridleway. Third category are restricted byways, which essentially covers your, your walkers, your horse riders, um, and all types of traffic apart from the mechanically propelled vehicles. And really this category has replaced the, the former uh, RUPPs, um, which we had under the, the, the previous schemes, um, largely rights for vehicular vehicles having been um, extinguished on those by Section 67 of the 2006 Act. And then finally, you've got the, the byways open to all traffic, um, which really are the better character of what used to be the RUPPs, um, where you've got 
all the rights, but it's generally a route that's uh, mainly used for the same purpose that a bridleway or, or footpath would be used for. And again, this is all covered in more detail in, in chapter seven of the book. Just a quick overview on creation. Uh, obviously, there's the, 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 the statutory provisions in the Highways Act uh, for public path creation agreements, so an agreement between the landowner and the local authority, which includes broads authorities and national park authorities for footpaths, bridleways, restricted byways to be created by the, the landowner and then to become maintainable at public expense. And there's particular factors that the local authority or the, the broads authority or the National Park Authority have to look at when they're deciding to enter into one of those agreements, which is set out in the Highways Act. And then you have the public path creation orders, which is essentially the, the power for the, the authority who identifies that it would be there's a need for a path and it should be in this location to create it, even if that's not done with the agreement of the landowner. And just two points to flag there, that obviously compensation may be payable uh, to the landowner uh, if there's been a depreciation in the value of the land as a result of the public right of way, or there's been damage through a disturbance with their enjoyment of that part of the land. Uh, and also just to flag that there's a, there's a similar power uh, for Natural England or the Natural Resources Body for Wales uh, to apply to the Secretary of State for a public path creation order under part one of the countryside and rights way out and that's linked to um, the long distance coastal path and um, that's the, the aspiration of the, the Marine and Coastal Act 2009. In terms of uh, other ways of creating a dedication is perhaps the uh, one that comes up perhaps more commonly in the in the contested um, situation. So either where there's a, a claim for a, a deemed statutory dedication under Section 31 of the Highways Act, so 20 years use before the way is called into question, um, and the onus in that situation is on the landowner to show that he didn't have an intention to dedicate the land. Uh, whereas under the common uh, dedication, um, the onus will be on the applicant who's claiming the public right of way to show that the evidence supports um, intention or inferred intention to, to dedicate on the part of the landowner and a common law. There's no specified period of use. It's going to depend on the book. Uh, is, a, is a case which is 18 months or sufficient, although uh, that is a case from 1827. So not perhaps uh, post section 31 uh, days. Just an important point to flag as well in terms of deemed statutory dedication under section 31, quite an important carve out is where it's land, the, the right is claimed over land that's owned by a public body. And there is um, a, a contention put forward that the dedication would be incompatible with the public purposes for which the land is held. And that's something that sometimes crops up in respect of land near water, particularly in this sort of port kind of context, or more commonly perhaps land that might be held by the MOD or another body in, in, in areas where there's a, an obvious inconsistency between um, the purpose of which the land is there, testing a farming, for example, and, and there being a public right of way through that area. Yeah. Sorry. My slide. Uh, so I mentioned obviously the answer to the definitive map and statement. Uh, sorry, I've gone forward too many. If a right of way is on the definitive map and statement, then that is treated as conclusive evidence of the of the right that's recorded. So there's a specific provision in the Highways Act which talks about the evidential value of the definitive map and statement um, in other proceedings. But importantly, it's not at present the the converse um, situation that if it's not on the map, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's only conclusive in respect of what's what is on it. Um, there's an obligation on the surveying authority, so usually the highway authority, or uh, to, to keep the map under review and up to date. And that's linked quite importantly to the, the, the power or the obligation to make changes uh, under Section 53 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. Uh, and that can either be done by the local authority of itself or more, more often through an application um, by you know, people uh, members of the public or by interested uh, landowners book does go through what the procedures are for following that with links to the the relevant guidance but just to note um one that's obviously most controversial uh is 
or the one that causes the most issues is the power in section 53, uh, 3 C, which is the discovery of evidence, um, which would indicate that a right of way that's not on the map um, subsists, or conversely, a right of way that is on the map isn't a public right of way. And that's the one that's usually relied on um, by people who are applying to put some map or a, a landowner uh, uh, who's trying to get it removed or changed. And also the power is not just there in terms of there's a public right of way here, it should be on the map or it's not on the map, but it can extend to the, the, the nature of the public right of way. So I'm aware, for example, there's a number of applications which um, are, well, there's currently a footpath that's been showing on the map, but it's claimed that there are right away rights. So it, it covers that as well. And also in terms of looking at wider development affecting the National Park or AONBs or other land, um, there's an obligation to modify if a public right of way is extinguished or created or altered by an order or another enactment. So um, James referred at the outset to, for example, the, the HS2 um, proceedings. There's a number of footpaths and public rights of way that are affected by, by, the, by, the, by the act that is specified in the schedule to the act. Uh, where the existing public right of way will be extinguished or diverted as a result of the act. And that's the sort of thing that needs to be picked up as well. Interference with public rights of way, again, quite a controversial issue. Um, can be interference by landowners, it can be interference by others. There's a lot of provision for this in part nine of the 1980 Act. Um, a key provision and it's often relied on almost to get injunctions to, 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 to prevent threatened interference is the offence under section 137, which uh, makes it an offence to willfully obstruct a highway without lawful excuse. Um, and again, that, that, that offence applies either, it can apply to uh, the landowner who puts obstacles in the way of the use, or it can apply to members of the public who are using a highway or public right of way in a way that interferes with interference by other members of the public and just, just in cases of interest, there's been a, a fairly recent Court of Appeal decision that looks at this in the context of protest rights. Um, it might seem like it's not a new issue, but it's a, a recent issue that's um, been considered by the Court of Appeal, and it's, it's going up to the Supreme Court, I understand, case of Siegler and direct different public prosecutions. Um, so that's in the context of protesters who are blocking use of a highway um, by, by other members of the public. But in terms of structures and obstacles, it's important to note that gates or styles or things like that can be placed on a public right of way if the original dedication was subject to that sort of structure. And that sort of um, restriction or condition ought to be noted on the definitive statement. There's also express provision made in, in, in the 1980 Act in respect of ploughing of fields where you've got cross field paths um, and there are uh, rights and might be relied on the common law if it's if it's not caught by one, section 162 or again it might be recorded on a definitive statement and just to note um that there are relating to bulls they are they are in the wildlife countryside act 1981 about the presence or otherwise of bulls on fields that are subject to a public right of way diversions and extinguishments Obviously, we're all be familiar with the maxim that once a highway, always a highway. Um, the fact a, a route may physically disappear doesn't mean that it's it ceases to be subject to highways rights. So even if it doesn't look like it's on the ground anymore, it can still be important to go through the express extinguishment or diversion provisions. Um, again, that, that's something that has come up in a few transport and works like orders that I've been involved in where there's been no route on the ground. There's been no actual ability to use the right of way for maybe 40, 50 years, but the rights are still there. So if you want to do something or put in an infrastructure project that would interfere with that, you need to deal with the legal rights, even though they're not in practice exercisable. And the specific provisions in section 1118, general provisions, and there's also the Highways Act, and there are also specific provisions that deal with um, level crossings, um, so uh, rights of way across railways. I said this is a very quick whistle stop tour, but it's covered in a bit more detail in chapter seven of the book. Chapter eight of the book moves on to look at the, the wider access rights going beyond strict public rights of way. Um, and obviously the, probably the most topical one at the moment is the, the right to roam, as it's called in the, the Countryside and Rights of Way Act 2000. 
Now, obviously, although the, the language that she used is the right to roam or the right of access, it's important to stress that the Act doesn't confer a freestanding right of access or roaming of the countryside. It's a right to enter onto or remain on access land, um, as is defined in Section 1, for the purpose of recreation, but that right is itself subject to restrictions and conditions which are specified in Part 1 or in Schedules to the Act. Access land is, is quite broadly drawn and there's a lot of individual definitions of individual words and terms even within the definition section. But essentially it covers any land that's shown as open country on a conclusive map, a conclusive map being one that's been prepared by um, uh, Natural England or Natural Resources Body for Wales. And again, open country is covers mountains which have their own definition um, or uh, heath, downs, moor, grasslands, but again, with the exceptions for land that appears to be improved or semi-improved grassland that's shown as registered common land, or if there's not such a map, then um, registered common land, coastal margin, which has got its own specific provisions that's linked to the, um, the long distance coastal path uh, that's brought in by the 2009 Act, and land that's dedicated under section 16 of the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, um, but doesn't include other land that's treated as being publicly accessible without the provisions of the Countryside and, and Rights of Way Act. In terms of accepted land, so land that doesn't become access land, we need to go to part one of Schedule 1, which carves out a number of types of land by description. Um, and it includes, for example, land that's covered by buildings or the curtilage of that land, a land within a park or garden, land within 20 metres of a dwelling, other than in respect of coastal margin, uh, land where soil's been disturbed by ploughing or such like. But again, there's definitely there's qualifications and further definitions in part two. Um, so particularly one, one thing that's picked up there is land that's used for the purpose of training race, race horses. There's a temporal restriction on that in terms of which periods of the day it is or isn't treated as being accessed land. Uh, and just to note that land that's often treated as publicly accessible apart from the 2000 Act includes metropolitan commons, um, which I'll touch on briefly in a moment, and also where there's access to monuments under public control under the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act uh, 1979. Again, the, the, sorry, jump forward one slide too many. The, the right to roam is a essentially a recreational right, but there are limits on what you can do. Understandably, it doesn't include the right, for example, to drive or ride vehicles, bicycles or horses, um, or to bring an animal up on a dog. And there are specific provisions in respect of restricting dogs elsewhere within the Act, um, camp or engage in any commercial activity. And there's also general power on an access authority, so particularly here, National Parks Authority, to make bylaws in respect of access areas, and access land in their area. Um, and there's also provision and powers within the Act to restrict access to particular parcels of access land for particular reasons. So directions can be made by the authority um, in respect of a parcel of land, if it's necessary for the management of that land or necessary for nature conservation purposes, um, owners of the land for, partic for particular reasons through particular periods, specifically linked to lambing or land that's used for the, the breeding or shooting of grouse. Um, and there's also a general power about not restri restricting access, but not for more than 28 days during any one given year. And just finally, um, so I mentioned coastal margin. There's obviously quite a lot going on at the moment around the long distance coastal path that's picked up by the, the 2009 Act. You've got powers um, under part one of the Crow Act for Natural England or National Resources Body for Wales to seek a public path for Asian order in respect of that. But it does extend slightly wide in that it's not the, the provision for, for land to be access land doesn't just extend to the line of the route but also extends to extend land either side of it so particularly two meters either side of the line of route um, or, or more land on the seaward side or the landward side depending on the uh, the nature of the land either side of it um, so again that's picking up the, the duties and the the provision for the long distance coastal path in the 2009 Act, but there's quite a lot of interrelationship throughout with the provisions of Crow. Uh, 
And just finally on common land is something that's talked about in the beginning of chapter eight. Um, misconception that common land is generally publicly owned or that it, there's a right to access all of it. Most of it is actually privately owned. Um, and in terms of access, the fact that it's common land doesn't confer a public right of access in and of itself, although it's now really brought in by, by virtue of the definitions in, in Crow of accent. But one important provision to note is section 193 of the Law of Property Act 1925, which is what maintains essentially what are called metropolitan commons, which provides a right of access to members of the public for, for air and exercise uh, to, to, to metropolitan common land, which isn't um, limited to urban areas, um, and does extend beyond the, the 1866-2099 Act commons, extends to metal real waste, but it's a very long definition within section one, subsection one, so I didn't set it all out. But that's just a brief overview, hopefully, of what, what you'll find in chapter seven and eight of the book on um, public rights of way and access to um, open countryside generally. Thank you. And with um, that, I think I hand back to James. Yes, thank you, thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, everybody. Um, we've had quite a few questions in, um, so we've got a bit of time um, to hopefully go through them. So I think there's questions for everybody. Um, I'm going to start with the questions that came in for, for Nick. I wonder if I could ask um, our speakers to turn on their cameras um, and also well, when they're speaking their audio. Um, so, so Nick, I think I've got th there's three things I think that have come in um, uh, for you. Um, First of all, I think just in terms of background, I, I think I mentioned at the outset, you've been involved in a case involving an incinerator. Uh, and I think it's potential impact uh, on an AOMB. I think someone's just asked whether there's anything more you can say about that. Um, not uh, in, ter in terms of general lessons learned, not a tremendous amount. Um, it was as all these planning inquiries are quite fact specific. So um, the incinerator, it was, 15k from the South Downs National Park, six from the Surrey Hills, and three from the High Wheeled AOMB. So the argument was obviously that it was in the setting of an AOMB and was going to um, affect that. The planning inspector on the facts of this particular case didn't think so. Um, the developer had tried to keep the spire, uh, uh, the stack, sorry, as slender as possible and had picked a colour palette that was in line with the closest AOMB's colour palette, which again, um, was something that was welcomed by the, those with the responsibility for that particular A&B and the others, the others didn't think it was going to be much of a problem. Um, so it was an argument that was very uh, um, enthusiastically run, but uh, sadly didn't get uh, anybody anywhere in that time. How often that's true. Um, there's two, there are two more substantive questions that you've been asked on, on the Sanford principle. So mm. I think the first one is, um, the Sanford principle obviously applies when one's looking at the competition between those two key purposes of natural beauty and, and recreation. There is, of course, though, a separate freestanding duty on national parks to foster um, economic um, development within their uh, park areas. And obviously the Sanford principle doesn't cover that, but have you any thoughts on how one deals with the potential conflict between uh, fostering economic development as against natural beauty and and or recreation on the on the other hand um it's a bit of a cop-out but i think primarily it's a matter for the for the decision maker i mean we've seen from uh, mr justice holgate's decision in harris um a couple of times that the duties placed both on national park authorities and on public authorities who are dealing with matters that might affect a national park um that there are broad levels of deference here that are being shown to them. Um, and so I, I, as long as, uh, if you ask one such an authority, um, you know, keeping a pretty meticulous log of what the considerations are, how you're balancing them, why one wins as against the other, um, really what, you know, the value judgment for what should take priority in a given case, save for the Sanford principle, when you're choosing between those two, those two national park considerations, um, it's really a matter for you. Uh, so I, I can't give you, I'm afraid, can't give you a bright line answer because I don't think there is one. Thank you. And then I think the final one, I think for you, um, Nick, was whether, do you foresee any important developments or disputes arising in the way in which the Sanford principle is applied? Uh, in particular, uh, I think the, the question that's been asked is, obviously there are arguments at the moment about 
rewilding um, certain areas, saying there's too many sheep in some of the national parks or that forests should be restored in, in others. Uh, is there any role for the Sanford principle, do you think, in relation to that? Um, I think there's probably a role for it. Certainly there's a lot of scope for interesting litigation, but um, I don't think... I'm conscious that I'm out on a limb in the last, you know, four years since 2016 have taught me not to try and predict anything ever. But um, I'm not entirely sure that it's sort of a, a going to be a silver bullet through which you can, for example, try and force a National Park Authority to rewild. Because um, there's, there's a couple of issues um, there. One, as I've said, like there's a huge amount of deference is given to National Park Authority. It's got to balance not just the two considerations where the sound of the principle applies, but against all of the other considerations as well. Even choosing when the principle comes into play is a matter for the authority, really, because it's when they decide that they can't successfully manage um, conservation and both the conservation and the um, public access principle. But then if you're even moving a little bit beyond that, then you've got, um, you know, okay, well, what is, you know, if you want to put, say, if you're a claimant that wants to say we have to rewild because that's the best way to enhance the natural beauty of a national park, well, what's natural beauty here? Um, but first, you know, there's, there's that classic aphorism, not a legal one, but it probably will be if someone runs this, which is beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, there is the statutory section in section 99 of the NERC Act 2006, which deals with um, what's natural beauty for the purposes of national parks. Um, and that was specifically included to undo the effects of a high court decision um, in America state saying that, um, you know, there had to be a high degree of naturalness such that, you know, well-maintained historic parkland didn't have natural beauty. So actually, if you're saying, you know, well, we've got to do this to, to enhance natural beauty, it's really probably going to be a matter for the National Park Authority as to what is the natural beauty that best requires maintaining. You then have a second issue, which is even if you can agree and say, well, you know, wild forest is, is, is the natural beauty of this particular national park, you've then got to try and figure out how to get there. Um, and that becomes almost a scientific judgment for the National Park authorities to, well, how do we best achieve this goal? And I would expect to see quite a lot of deference, again, given to their views on methodology, not just outcome, probably akin to the deference that's given scientific regulators in um, dealing with science. So um, the overarching point is I think there's scope to run a lot of interesting cases, but I'm not sure it's going to you know, necessarily um, deliver particular outcomes. Yeah, I and mean, we've waited, we waited what, about um, 45 years for a case, a proper case on the Stanford principle. So I don't know whether we'll have more, more, a more regular number after this, probably not, I, I suspect, but we'll have to see. Um, can I turn to uh, Matthew Dale Harris next? So, um, Matthew, there's been a, a question that's been asked that um, decision makers currently rely on uh, landscape visual impact assessments um, to satisfy paragraph 172 of the MPPF and to assess harm uh, to AMMBs and national parks. But, but the point that's been put is that LVIAs deal with landscape rather than natural beauty, um, which is the object of um, obviously national parks in, in particular. Uh, what's the, is there any legal position or angle on this? Well, I mean, I, I think that obviously it's important to remember the start, that the starting point um, is, is going to be the, the particular legal duties that apply to the decision maker in relation to A and Bs under Section 85 of the 2000 Act or, or 11A of the 1949 Act if you're dealing with national authority, national park authorities. Um, you're looking at having regard to the purpose of conserving and enhancing natural beauty that's the natural beauty of the area of land designated. And, you know, a, proper, a properly conducted landscape and visual impact assessment. Um, well, you know, I take the point its focus is perhaps a bit broader, looking at landscape character, you know, as part of assessing what is valuable and properly describing and assessing the impacts of a development upon that landscape. Um, it will need to have regard to, it will need to understand and demonstrate understanding of what aspects of this landscape are, um, you know, form part of the natural beauty and the special qualities of the protected landscape. So, um, you know, I think there's no principal problem with LVIAs being used to address the question of, whether, of impact on um, 
on A O M B on 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 national park. Um, it's going to be for decision makers to properly scrutinise the L V I A work that's been carried out, um, and, and interrogate that in in in, in an appropriate manner. Um, but so I think I think it's a, there's no there's no legal position saying you can't re use an L V I A. And in fact, if you're properly applying the Glivia principles, um, you know, the issue should be picked up. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Matthew. Can I turn to John? Um, John, there's a couple of things that have come in. I think the first one um, focuses on footnote 55 of the MPPF, which is the uh, new footnote in the MPPF 2018 version that seeks to give some meaning to what major development is in uh, AOMBs and national parks. Um, and amongst the things that you're supposed to consider uh, is now the adverse impact on the purposes for which the area is designated and what's been asked is does that mean decision makers should in looking whether there's major development consider impact on AOMB management plan policy where those management plans set out the policies for conservation uh, and enhancement any thoughts on that John uh, thanks James I, I mean the answer is to the extent that those uh, management plan policies reflect the purposes for which the area was designated, then the answer is yes. I mean, footnote 55 is concerned with uh, trying to work out what major development is in national parks and AONBs on the basis that whilst the development management policy definition uh, of uh, major development may be relevant to determining whether development is major development in, in national parks and AONBs, um, <coughs> I mean, there's actually quite an extensive section in the book that actually looks at major development and the definition of major development. Um, and a very useful um, uh, section which actually looks at a number of different uh, decisions, inspectors' decisions that have been taken subsequent to the Green case, which I was in. Um, uh, and the right and the wrong approach <laughs> Uh, that inspectors have taken in relation to trying to work out what major development is. But I mean, I say the short answer is that to the extent that those management plan policies reflect the purposes for which that area has been designated, then they would be relevant to determining whether or not it is major development for the purposes of the NPPF. Thank you. I think so someone also raised a point about whether um, whether the management plans should be part of the development plan and I mean my thought on that is that that's a blessing and a curse really isn't it because uh, okay if management plans were to become you know part of the development statutory development plan then obviously they'd have more status when they were adopted but of course you'd have to go through the full consultation and examination procedures required for plans and as we see sort of day by day as plans fall down at that stage um, it's not an easy set of things to, 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 to get through whereas at the moment you know management plans can be made with relatively little uh, in terms of that kind of process so I guess there's sort of pros and pros and cons yeah I mean I should say James that I mean yeah. one of the Glover review um, proposals is that is that um, AONBs should have single development plan documents uh, which actually then would be part of the development plan, would carry to the statutory weight, et cetera, um, because it's very conscious, the, the review panel was very conscious that you can have inconsistencies in terms of the policies relating to a single AONB, where those policies are currently being promoted through different local plans because the AMB straddles two or more uh, local authority areas. Yep. So there is a proposal. I mean, I say the government hasn't yet responded to the Glover review. Um, it came out in September last year. It, the, the latest update is that it will respond. But as I say, we don't know whether it's going to be this year or next year. Um, but it may, it may be that going forward that you will see a single development plan document dealing with, um, with AONBs. Thanks. And then, John, I think the other thing uh, I was going to ask you, obviously, the Glover review recommends the expansion of these sort of protected landscape areas. Um, how does that fit, do you think, with the government's commitment to build 300,000 homes a year, as, as most recently articulated, I think, in the white paper? Yeah, well, more, more more recently than that, I think in the last couple of days by um, Robert Jenrick in response to the sort of outcry by a number of uh, MPs in relation to that number. 
Um, I mean, the answer is it's going to increase the tension. Um, I mean, AONBs, national parks, account for about a quarter of, of the land area in, in, in England. Um, if you're going to expand, they will be part of protected areas if we have a zonal system. If you're going to include then buffer zones around those areas as part of the protected areas, you're obviously reducing the amount of land that you can then you know, build 300,000 um, houses on a year. So I think there's, there's going to be increased tension and in, in the government policy and the, the application of the standard methodology is to reflect the fact that you know, you're not going to have major house building in protected areas. So increasingly those houses are going to have to put in areas, the growth areas, et cetera, which are not going to include national parks. So the more you expand those designated protected areas, the less land you have to play with in terms of house building. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that sort of national parks in the US are sort of different creatures, but I think it's quite a controversial issue out over there about the protection zones around national parks. Um, obviously, they have a zonal system, um, but I think it's not in America, it's not so much the building in the national parks that's the issue, but it's the exclusion of development in potentially quite a wide protection zone that can cause big, big, big problems. I mean, I think it's quite difficult to see how, how one would translate that here. Okay, thank you, John. Um, James, can I, uh, there's a couple of things uh, that you've been asked. Uh, I think, first of all, um, in terms of off-site biodiversity gain, are there any limitations in terms of the proximity uh, to the development site itself? Does the off-site biodiversity net gain have to be within a certain air, uh, distance from the planning application site, or could it be anywhere within the national park, or could it be beyond? Uh, thanks, James. Yeah, I, I mean, the short answer to that is that there are, certainly on the face of the bill, there are no limitations in terms of uh, proximity but, uh, in, ter where, in terms of the, of the site, the off-site site that you're developer would be proposing to, um, to improve in terms of biodiversity value. Um, I, I suspect um, the, the, there will be lots of arguments about the actual biodiversity metric that comes out because the, the, this question raises quite an, quite an interesting point about whether effectively you can, you can buy off um, a local authority by, by damaging a, um, your own uh, immediate site and within your red line, you can buy it off by by going to or proposing off-site developments way beyond um, the immediate area and in fact even in other local planning authorities um, areas. And I, I think the answer to this is the biodiversity metric will be tweaked to incentivize and to ascribe more value to um, off-site uh, improvement where for example, it may be closer or in some way ecologically connected to the site. And the reason for that is that um, under the, uh, the in, in Schedule 14, um, buried away in there is a reference to what biodiversity value of registered off-site biodiversity gain, um, how, how that's measured. And it says it's measured under the biodiversity metric in relation to development to which it is allocated. Now, I suspect what will happen is that that will be, that will be used to tweak the, the metric in a way to incentivize off-site benefits that are slightly closer to the development, but it's, it's gonna be up for grabs in when, when the metric comes out. Yeah. And uh, one other thing I was gonna ask you was, um, ha um, there's obviously a proposal um, half-baked as it is in, in the white paper to get rid of section 106 obligations entirely um, and to replace them with a, an infrastructure levy. I'm not sure that proposal fully understands what section 106 is do, but but leave that to one side. Um, if that was what the government's going to do, abolish section 106, how does that fit with the proposals in the environment bill which envisage 30-year management plans being secured? By section 106? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I think whoever drafted the white paper just that they just didn't have much, they, they weren't even really considering the environment bill coming through because it, it, it's not consistent with it at all. The whole point of the environment bill is it, it envisages these benefits to be secured through some form of legal, legally binding agreement, whether that's a section 106 or a, 
um, a conservation um, agreement or covenant. Um, replacing all of that with just a, a carte blanche infrastructure levy, uh, it's going to be very hard to see how that actually secu secures the, the, the completion or the, the fulfilling of, of um, obligations in a management plan. So, um, and also there, I think there's some suggestion about infrastructure levy um, not running with the land anyway. I mean, I haven't, I haven't um, uh, checked back on that. But the, uh, so the short answer is that the white paper is hasn't even really grappled with this particular issue, but it will create problems. And the environment bill will probably have to be um, rewritten in respect of um, uh, its the, the, these net gain obligations. Yeah, well, or, 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 or I think the government might wake up when they get their responses to, to realise that you, you can't just get rid of the whole of Section 106 and replace it with a levy, because that assumes that 106 only deals with money, which obviously it doesn't. I mean, it's just... It's just a sort of fundamental misunderstanding of, of how the planning system works, I think. But but there we are. Um, uh, so I think we'll move on to, to, to Jacqueline. There's a couple of questions for you. Uh, first of all, um, uh, Jacqueline, is there a cutoff date for modifications to the definitive map and statement for old, ancient public rights of way? Yes, uh, there's a, I think the terminology that might be floating around the public domain at the moment is lost paths um, and under crow 2000 uh, they brought in a provision for essentially highways that or footpaths and right-of-ways that came into existence before 1949 that weren't on the definitive map and statement by a cutoff date just to be extinguished the the current date for, for that is january 2026 although i think there are there are obviously um representations being made in some courts about trying to push that back in light of um, there is a bit of a backlog in dealing with some applications and I think that's caused some concern in some quarters. Thank you and I think the other thing you've been asked is uh, does the chapter in the book cover the issue about bicycles on footpaths? Chapter seven does pick up about bicycles uh, in terms of case law apologies if I misspoke I don't think there is a specific case that deals specifically with bicycles um, but the Matthias case uh, which is an 1861 case that is referred to um, in the book does touch on uh, some of the, the uses that may or may not be thought to be falling within a footpath or might constitute a nuisance that might need to be thought about in any given case. Okay All right well thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks. Um, I think probably th there are a few others, but I think uh, looking at the time, we should probably draw this to, to a close. So I would obviously just like to thank um, all our speakers uh, for their excellent uh, contributions today. Um, and obviously, uh, as I have a vested interest in it, I would say to you, uh, please do think about buying our, uh, our book to which um, uh, many hours of work have gone in and which does deal with a number of these issues in a lot more detail. I think John mentioned, you know, one of the things we do cover, and I think someone asked about this, do we cover the major development issue? Uh, that is probably the subject of the longest chapter uh, in the book, what is major development? Uh, and as many of you will know, that that's probably my favourite topic uh, in this in this area. Um, uh, and indeed, the green case that John mentioned is a case which, although I wasn't in it at all, spends a very long time looking at my opinions, the Marici opinions, as they're sometimes referred to. Um, on that issue of major development. But there's a really quite wide range of issues. I hope you found them interesting as at least a taster uh, of what there is uh, in the book. Uh, and we thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>